Hello there! Today I would like to share with you uh, my thoughts about a movie, a film by Spanish director Alex de la Iglesia, I watched last, la last night. It was presented at the uh, 2013 edition of the Rome Film, film Festival, which some of you might know as the pathetic, unlucky, idiotic cousin of the Venice Film Festival, who has zits on its face and doesn't get laid. It's really that pathetic. But regardless, this film, um, you know, this year has been surprisingly rich of films about witches. And by that I mean we had, all, we had three films about witches, which is actually far more than I would expect to have in a year, in a whole year of uh, cinematography. First we had uh, Ansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, which was baffling and sexist, but otherwise pretty harmless. Then we had the, <laughs> the hilariously atrocious opus by Rob Zombie, uh, Lords of Salem, which is based off one of his old music videos, no less. And it's about as that is so ridiculous, ridiculously pretentious, yet unintentionally hilarious. I cannot help but smile whenever I think about it. It's really, <laughs> really that stupid. And it's worth a look just for that, but... Anyway. The third film, the third uh, witch-focused film I've seen this year, is exactly the film I saw last night. Um, and it's the only one of this uh, ideal trilogy to actually do something pretty clever with the concept of witchcraft. The title of the film is uh, Le Brujas de Nimbon... Um, I'm just going to use the international title, which is Witching and Bitching. Uno soy un árbol. Un hombre desnudo. Un soldado verde. Un niño. Es el elegido. Al final, chaval, ¿tú estás loco? ¡Qué asco! Estoy hasta los cojones de la pensión compensatoria, de los jueces y de la bruja de su madre. ¡Qué asco! ¡Aparte, señora! ¡Abre, hijo de puta! Silvia, perdona. A ver, me, te pregunto yo lo que le das de merendar al niño. ¡Hotelera! ¡No la toques! ¡Oye, que se estuvo feo, joder! La brujería, el concepto, nació aquí. ¡Hola, chaval! ¿Qué hace con la escoba? Barrer no, desde luego. Pero ellas nunca piensan lo que parece que piensan. ¿Y en qué piensan? No lo sé, pero piensan otra cosa. ¿Y nosotras qué somos? Una chica de tu edad lo que tiene que hacer es drogarse. Folla como una perra, miente todo lo que puedas engañar a los hombres que estás en la edad. Ha llegado el momento de la venganza. ¿A dónde vais? A impedir que tu madre destruya la civilización occidental. ¿Te parece bien? ¡Ayuda! ¡Y hará justicia! ¡Justicia! ¿Pero qué dices? ¡Tú eres idiota! ¿Que me dejo llevar? great. Let me tell you beforehand. This film is brilliant. Now, uh, before continuing, if you don't know who Alex de la Iglesia is, then stop this video, go look, it, go look, it, look him up, uh, see a couple of his films, then come back here, resume the video, and hear me saying this. You're welcome. Okay, um, the last film of Alex de la Iglesia I watched was in a, in a Venice Film Festival some times ago. It was known as The Last Circus. That was actually the side of a director that was more 
shall we say, busy, passionate, or downright or righteously furious about something, as that field was an, a complex and very much in-your-face allegory about, uh, that satirizes, uh, pretty much com commentates in a very venomous way about the, the tragic social and political debacle of, the, of his country, Spain, over the years they were ruled after, under the iron fist of Francisco Franco. And the allegory is uh, symbolized by uh, two clowns, a uh, happy and a sad, and a sad one, fighting over, fighting over a girl by the name of Spain. It's a love triangle that, that slowly escalates uh, until the, to the point that they start really to mutilate each other and even destroy everything that's around them, as if they're, as if they're about to cause World War Three. It's as, it's as ridiculous as it is poignant and really, really disconcerting to watch, too. It was Django Unchained before Django Unchained existed. Only... So, only, only some sort of a... reaching some sort of a zenith of nirvana, of ludicrousness mixed with ruthlessness that really creates an interesting, paradoxical emotional state that really makes you think about what you're watching. Imagine uh, the first Machete film, only, only less downright fun and more downright grotesque. Now, that was the Alex de la Iglesia that was more, uh, shall we say, socially uh, adept. The the, the angry Alex de la Iglesia, the furious Alex de la Iglesia. But most of the time, Alex de la Iglesia is a director that loves to make fun of himself and his fellow man. He is a genius, he's a genius of dark comedies, of black comedies, with great, great sense of pacing, deliveries, and interesting characters with inner depths that serves the purpose of whatever ironic commentary he wants to make about something. Uh, for example, there is this old comedy of his called Crimen Ferpecto, which is, which is, trans, which is which roughly translates as uh, the perfect crime, only with the P and the F switching position to point out that it's not a perfect crime at all. Irony in the title. In the title. So this latest film is actually uh, as a, it's a comedy, a, ne a very, very fun black action fantasy comedy that starts off pretty, pretty unsettlingly fast, and then it's like a roller coaster that never, ever, ever, ever stops going up. It's really an escalation of things happening right in front of you that you you least expect to happen, and it's gloriously entertaining, and also poignant too. It's a satire about misogyny, and not just about misogyny, it's a satire about all preconceived social behaviors, or even counter social behaviors, born from sexual identities, both from males and females. And all the idiosyncrasies they create in our contemporary contemporaneity, and it's really brilliant. The protagonists are this group of men uh, who are so incredibly afraid of women; they resort to misogyny as a means to assert whatever pathetic ounce of masculinity they think they still have, and which is great because it seems the movie seems to <clears throat> just of it seems to. Uh, describe the to trivialize in an ironic fashion the entire bloody history of witch hunting and not just witch hunting but the entire history of art and the way it portrayed women since ancient Greek since the ancient classical Greek times as a result of men having an atavist fear of women. 
and the film reflects, reflects primarily on that. So we have this guy who is a, who is a father who is divorced from his wife and decides to, uh, to rob a store with a bunch of other people and he goes up dressed as Jesus Christ. Incidentally, other, people, other, other members of his gangs are dressed as a green soldier from Toy Story, uh, Minnie Mouse, SpongeBob SquarePants, and uh, they pull off the... <laughs> and even better, this guy is a terrible role model, a terrible father, because he brings his son to the robbery, because he wants to spend time with him, and because he wants to flee the country with his son, so he can escape the is awful, monstrous ex-wife. <laughs> and nothing, nothing is meant to be taken seriously about this film. Again, it's ironic, it's humorous, it's, it's satirical. But that doesn't mean the characters don't have layers. They have layers. They're interesting. In fact, they almost have proper arcs going from being this misogynist, yet strangely likable characters who are so terrified of the other sex, of confrontation of the other sex, that they pretty much are complete nervous wrecks from start to finish. And so they come across a community of witches who actually, have, who actually think uh, this guy's child is the chosen one to ignite the apocalypse and devour and kill all men. All men. And this is brilliant because the witches in this film, which are, which are really, really, really compelling and fun to watch as well, they're fantastic villains, and I'm telling you, they are so into the performance. Their, their, witching, their witching movement and their hate of man, their hatred of man, which actually results into literal man-eating situations, men eating dinners and whatnot, is actually the result of, man, of the history of men persecuting women. So on, the, so, on one hand we have men who are afraid of women, and on the other hand we have women who, ha who hate men so much because of the persecution that they become exactly what, what everything Man has always feared about women. It's satire! It's, it's genius! Not only that, but all, all the comedies, all the gags, all the characters have fantastic chemistry with one another. I mean, the, sol the Toy Story soldier guy, whose name is Tony, I remember, uh, has, a girl, has his own girlfriend, and which he thinks is not... Uh, he thinks she is too much for him and he cannot handle the pressure because he's kind of an incompetent idiot. And then there is this guy who's a cab driver who gets dragged into the <laughs> into the story when they actually uh, <laughs> steal his cab a la GTA San Andreas. And actually, uh, I, this is not a gratuitous reference, actually the, the kid character in the film actually points out that this feels like GTA San Andreas. They even have the police up on them, there's car crashing, there's chasing, <laughs> there's everything. So they come across this forest and they come across the witches who actually have a prophecy about them specifically. And even though they meet this young witch who is the daughter of the ringleader of the community, which is, a, which is almost a Disney-esque villain, so much she is into a role. They even got a musical number. I kid you not, they, all the witches, at some point they are a musical number. They, this film has everything. So anyway, this girl actually falls in love with the main character, who is the guy who has a kid and, and, the, and the ex-wife. And at some point, he, he finds himself confronting her, who, want, who, wants to, who wants to know why she is not enough for him, because she loves him and she would betray her family for him, but he's just too afraid to confront her. And, she, and that represents his entire fear of confronting women, only this time the woman he's confronting 
not only is emotionally unstable, but she has enough magic power to destroy everything around her. And the beautiful part is how the characters grow, because the man, the guy, learns to actually stand up for himself and let go of the fear of confrontations with the, the other sex, which in turn makes him a better person and a human being. And the crazy witch girl actually doesn't have to change all that much. The only thing she needs to change is her man-eating habits, because otherwise she's already interesting and really fun the way she is, and he likes her the way she is. So there is a compromise in the end, but it doesn't really... She is not the one that needs to change. He is. And that's, and that's, and that's brilliant. That's some sort of a reverse... That's reversing the classic sexist tropes <clears throat> to the advantage of the overarching irony. And again, the overarching irony is the making fun of all the preconceived behaviors or even counter behavior, such as the witches, is essentially born from the uh, the gender roles, the preconceived gender roles. And it doesn't end her. It's this film is rich with details and interesting characters, each having their own arcs and uh, <clears throat> recurring gags, and also having fantastic chemistry with one another. It the humor never lets up or. Or, or always a dull moment. It's, it's a continuous. It's a continued escalation of things happening until it reaches some point of a pure, brilliant bizarreness that would make Joss Whedon drool in fangas in fangasmic passion. And speaking of which, uh, there is a there is a twist towards the end of the film, which I won't spoil you. But uh, let me tell you this, there is a scene in which the boy, the young boy, accidentally fumbles inside the, the mouth of a fake construction in the form of a witch, which is supposed to be some sort of a uh, carousel or for kids, and he, he, he goes into the mouth and ends up uh, outside of the structure from the bottom rear. That scene is foreshadowing. That's all I'm going to tell you. This is a film that needs to be watched. It is and very entertaining. Alex de la Glace has this uncanny ability to produce an opus of various levels of intelligence, a satire and irony that with, with different layers of meanings all communed through a very expertly handled cinematography and, and a film whose appeal can actually be broad and appreciated even at a superficial level, just for the comedic ex exchanges alone and the, and the formidable acting of all the characters involved. Even the kid actor is fantastic in his role. There is not a single character in this film that's not inherently hilarious some way or the other. In fact, this film has a much broader appeal. In fact, it's kind of been distributing by Universal Pictures throughout the world, which means you guys are probably going to see it in your area, if you live in the USA, with the, with the very amusing title of Witching and Pitching. You might be turned, you might be turned off by the title, but let me tell you beforehand, this film will make your day. In fact, it's probably one of the best films of the year, as far as I'm concerned. It takes an especially talented director to convey deeper meanings and ironic commentaries about misogyny, the nature of misogyny, and even the behaviors and the counter-behaviors born from misogyny, both on males and females. To be able to do that and still giving us in the format of a black, hilarious, perfectly acted out and directed black comedy that has a broader appeal than something of this nature might have. 
it's it, what I'm saying is, is it is clever on different levels, but it can also be enjoyed on a very superficial level. Giving him, a, giving him, giving this film, as I said time and time again, a a world a worldwide appeal. It can be appreciated by the small time niche crowds as well as the big time movie going crowds and critics and the su and the such like. I love this film. <laughs> it is already one of my favorite films of the of 2013. So again, don't get dissuaded by the title, the English title, which is again witching and bitching. This is a film you need to act. You need to add to your uh, films I need to go see this year list. I will tell you more about this film, but really, any more than that would go into spoiler territory, and I really don't want to spoil the <laughs> fantastic, fantastic moments and gags that this film is filled with. You just have to take my word for it and go watch it. And also, Go watch The Last Circus as well. It will blow your mind. Well, this has been Mad Dog, and thank you for watching. A mí las brujas no me dan miedo. A mí lo que me dan miedo son los hijos de puta. Ah, um, before I forgot, actually, I have a, I have a small complaint about this film. There is this one character, which is the character of the ex-wife, which starts off as a really witchy person, so to speak, but it actually becomes a more interesting character because she's portrayed for the majority of the film as a really, really worried mother who's trying to track back her son, which, for all she knows, he's being kidnapped by the father. The problem is, at some point, something happens to her that um, kind of turns her into a one-dimensional character so to speak. And I know it's all part of the overarching irony of this film, but this is the only this is the only case in this film in which the irony actually is detrimental to the development of a character. That's the only complaint I have about this film because it's otherwise really 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 funny. the male feels side of things because he himself is a male. Ci sono tre bagni! Tre And so forth. 